Today we are joined by Olivia Juwadi. Olivia is an accredited UKCP psychotherapist in London, England, who works with severe trauma and chronic illness support. She teaches online counseling and supervision to train counselors and psychotherapists, and also specializes in dissociative disorders. Over the years, she has given talks about topics like dissociation, polyfragmented DID, captivity, cultural possibilities in trauma, diabulimia, and others. Some of her training came from UK trauma and dissociation experts like Dr. Valerie Sinason and Remy Aquaron, as well as overseas clinicians such as Babette Rothschild and Dr. Marlene Steinberg. Olivia also grew up in an environment that contained many adverse childhood experiences, which went unnoticed. Before healing via psychotherapy, she also experienced captivity in her early 20s, which didn't come to light until she told her story to a reporter via Amnesty International in 2007. Her survival was also at risk because she had to manage her type 1 diabetes with limited medical supplies. Some of her drive to educate people is that there are still views that these things don't happen in the West, and that clinicians and law enforcement need to hear the truth so that they can assist. Thank you for joining us, and welcome, Olivia. Hello, my name is Olivia Juardi, and I work in private practice and at the Clinic of Dissociative Studies in London in the UK. Um, I've been a therapist for 14, 15 years now. A majority of the time I have worked with trauma and severe trauma and also from those that have been in war-based captive abuse or stalking situations, which I'm going to talk about today. All right. So war, our fundamentalists here. Well, in war situations, the answer is yes. Um, they may be known by a variety of names, maybe by the group that they belong to, or maybe um, the army they belong to if two are if two military forces are fighting each other. Um, and when people think about war, they're thinking about explosions, damage, buildings being crushed, um, warplanes, warships, um, and everything associated with war. Um, which we've seen more re recently in the Ukraine. Um, for, for the people involved, there is going to be um, somebody who is for a certain situation and somebody who's against this. And it usually starts off with some people disagreeing, maybe in government, and then it can lead to much greater situations such as war. Um, it can be kicked off by a variety of things. Um, so you've got a lot of people angry in countries overseas or with destruction happening around them. But one doesn't necessarily think of the UK, which at the present is a safe country. Um, and when they do think of the UK, they may think of the IRA during the Troubles or um, situations like 7-7 um, or even 9-11. Um, they don't really think about the situations that I'll be discussing today. So one wouldn't think of a normal looking home with somebody being held captive by somebody who was in a war situation. That's not one one of the harms one imagines in the UK. Um, but it is it does happen maybe to a rarer degree, but it, it can happen. Because when wars finish, or even before they're finished, it's not only the people that are being harmed that escape, but it's also the perpetrators of some of what's going on that escape as well. 
and we tend to think about war as um, guns, um, physical violence, um, shootings, um, bombs, um, maybe air raids, uh, busy hospital settings because there's so much trauma after. Um, one doesn't usually think of a normal looking home on their local high street or a flat among many flats. Um, but it does happen and it does need to be discussed because it gets missed. Um, so why is this kind of trauma different from, say, domestic violence? Well, with domestic violence, it, there is usually two participants who may have had a relationship at the beginning and the relationship has then become difficult and harm is then a happened that occurs against the other person um, it can have many of the aspects to domestic violence but it's on a different sort of level because the captivity is war based so the threats will be um, people are going to kill you we're going to get shot at um, uh, or things will blow up or um, there's going to be vehicle bombings um, in an area which the person who when they first stepped into that situation knew wasn't the case um, for instance, in the UK. So when somebody is in one of these situations, they may be in a perfectly normal looking home. Um, but what exactly is behind the curtain that never opens or the piece of wood that only covers one window or the tape that covers the entire window um, for months on end or well, what might be happening is captivity and um, I'm talking about war-based captivity so the talk will always be of the war situation of the place the person um, comes from so the captor comes from they may have been in a terrorist group they may have been in a um, type of group that advocates violence and some of the violence they may have been taught to use against another person is not only threats but also sexual violence because the shame that's involved with sexual violence means that um, people are more afraid of reporting this sort of thing happens. And um, the statistics for um, those that get prosecuted for sexual crimes, even a single sexual crime in this country, is, is quite low. Um, I mean, it is improving somewhat, but really not enough. Um, so someone may be held captive and sexually abused every single day. They may be starved, maybe kept on three, four hundred calories a day. Um, for the entire time, they may lose lots of weight. They may have um, time schedules such as you can only go to the toilet at this time. You can only wear these clothes. 
you're not allowed to have a heater, you're not allowed to have a blanket, you have to sleep on the floor. So um, some of the rules of the household will be very different than a regular household. Um, some of these things may be seen in domestic violence situations, but there is um, an added part to it. When these kind of um, situations happen with um, physical, sexual, emotional abuses or, and spiritual abuses occurring, the amygdala in the brain can be sort of hijacked and there can be misfiring of alarm signals so it will feel like the alarm signals are going off all the time not only at the time when you're being harmed but also at the time when the person may be away and you're not being harmed um, but because the amount of harm that's accrued over that time uh, your brain is letting you know you're in danger at all moments and so it can feel like a cycle that happens every single day there is often not a calendar a clock um, any digital devices things like radios so the person may not have any awareness of what month it is, what day it is, um, and if um, they may only know of time due to sounds, so they may realise that um, at eight thirty, kids they can hear kids going to school. And about 3.30, they can start to hear kids coming home. But there is also that added thing that they don't want to make sound because they don't want to push out this harm onto somebody who's a child. Um, so there is almost that protective factor over small children even though they're the only ones that are alerting you of when the time is during the day. And then, of course, when you don't hear kids, it's either the week, uh, the weekend or it could mean that um, their time schedules are all different. So they're not getting up early in the morning. They're not coming in at about 3, 30, 4 o'clock. So time gets very messed up as well. And with only one meal a day, that isn't even a definition of time either. So when somebody does come out of one of these situations, her brain is still kidnapped. I say her, but this can also be him because this can happen f for men as well as women. Um, and she will step out into a world that she has been reprogrammed to think as incredibly scary. Um, she may have been told that the police, lawyers, solicitors, security guards, um, anyone wearing a suit, anyone in a uniform, anybody who shouts loudly uh, is somebody who's going to kill you immediately and that doesn't mean that they even have to be carrying guns it could just mean that they may be they look completely normal but the person will think that they've got guns hidden within them and not just guns sort of you know, a gun that can fit in your bag or your pocket. Um, but, uh, you know, they will be thinking that you have hidden uh, the really big machine guns that are used in war. So the thinking can get really, really mi mixed up. Um, 
even after leaving the there's sleep disturbances all the time due to nightmares um every sound every voice um even coughing heavy breathing anything can be a signal to that person that they're going to be terrorized again so it's a very frightening situation for them um and even though the physical abuse the sexual abuse the coercive abuse spiritual abuse emotional abuse has stopped it hasn't in the head they're still feeling that non-stop and they will find the world a terrifying place they won't see it as you and i see it they'll see it as any moment i may be killed and that's very hard for say clinicians to understand if they happen to see a therapist um so on the first day of therapy if they say that you know a terrorist is going to kill them when they get home um that um the police are going to turn on them that military are going to get them in the home it's going to sound a bit strange to many therapists but for those that have worked with um war-based trauma this will will sound familiar but it doesn't fit for say the uk it would fit for say afghanistan or for other war zones in frequent years it wouldn't seem to fit for the uk so the client may be dismissed as being sort of confused or having strange thoughts maybe they're psychotic or something when actually they're telling the truth it it has been that scary and they didn't know how to escape and their brain has not yet escaped from that situation so um they need a lot of help and it, the help may be a lot longer than expected um generally the first therapies that are offered um, through services like the national health service are six to 12 sessions of cbt therapy um, and cbt therapy can help later on but it's really not a great one for starting off in therapy because you need almost a baseline um, of just knowledge of what's normal and at this stage when you're first day in therapy you won't know what's normal at all you don't know whether your therapy is the therapist may pull out a machine gun even though it it seems crazy to the therapist or not necessarily crazy but unrealistic um people will also distance themselves from everybody else because everybody else may inform on them um so there has been a kind of extra added layers added to everything um and you know it is quite normal to see security guards police you know in town or maybe in a shopping center or <laughs> standing outside a police station but for someone who's been through this type of harm um it's terrifying um it's too hard to deal with so they become very frightened and they kind of stop associating with anybody and also associating with life um, they may also have really bad eating patterns because of the type of 
food schedule they were on when held captive. They may be afraid of big things and small things, or they may they may actually see um, more situations on TV and think that it's normal because that's what their brain looks like all the time. Or it's what your brain, uh, one's brain thinks the world looks like. So when they do see, you know, a film of a war situation in another country, it just seems to be normal whereas you know in the past few years we've looked at the Ukraine and thought that definitely looks different from the UK but you know we've seen the devastation um, we understand why people have traveled here for safety um, we understand who's fighting who but for someone that has recently come out of this situation they will look at the events happening in the Ukraine and think that's normal because of the way they've been programmed. They will have to learn what is normal in real, in you know, actually, um, because the brainwashing um, will be on so many layers. So. But where can people go that have been through this? Um, first steps might actually just be calling Samaritans just so they get used to talking to another person. No, Samaritans is not going to be able to resolve everything, but it begins to help them to talk to another person because they may not have done that for a while, even after getting out. Um it can help to go to places that the captor said were unsafe. So, for instance, um, crowded places or places with people. So, one some of the examples may be travelling on the underground and going from one end of the line to the other over and over. It's almost like exposure therapy, um, just to get used to people and just sitting there going, they're not going to kill me, they're not going to kill me, they're not going to shoot me, I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe, may be part of their healing process because they may need some of that in order to get to the stage where they can go into an office and say, I need therapy. Um, there may be um, one person that had been through this had their wallet stolen so they needed to report it to the police and which seems like what you were supposed to do um, but for them they sat outside the police station for almost an hour because they were too afraid to talk to the police to say their wallet was stolen and of course you have to get a police number in order to sort out the money side you know with credit cards and identification and things like that um, but it took a really long time and um, you know in London and some of the, the bigger cities after terrorist events happened, there would be anti-terror terror police um, with, with the bigger guns. And so the police were carrying the guns that had been explained to them during their captivity. So the machine guns. Um, so when they're seeing police, say, walking in London with machine guns, it matches what they'd been told in captivity. So suddenly something was matching. And for them, 
they they sat in Charing Cross Station um, it, on one of the seats while the anti-terror police were there for a long time because there were, were things going on um, saying they're not here to shoot me, they're not here to shoot me, they're not here to shoot me over and over until they gain some awareness that actually they're not a target at all. Um, and the thing is that if they do speak to other people about things they're worried about, such as being shot by the anti-terror police, people think they sound silly or a bit strange or, you know, the... so they can also feel like they're in isolation as well because when they become friendly with somebody and they start to say, oh, these are the things I worry about and talk about the police, security guards, um, lawyers um, and authority figures, then um, it's, it's hard for them to con connect with the community. So they do become isolated. So I've talked about some of the support and help and guidance um, one could get. Um, I think that if people have family, loved ones, such as, you know, if they're married or they have a boyfriend or girlfriend, um, then that can also help because what may happen right after a captivity situation is that they will connect to a certain person and that might be a family member or it may be their partner and follow them around all the time because they're so scared of being on their own and this could also mean that trying to follow them into the toilet because they don't want to be apart. And it's not that they have any interest of what goes on in the toilet. It's just they feel that if the there is a door separating them, they will suddenly be whisked off to that captivity situation again. And that does sound a bit strange if you are in a relationship um so it it's quite difficult to get the the help you need when um when you have survived this so how much time does it help uh how much time does it take to heal from this actually it could be a long time um we're talking years could be up to a decade depending on the amount of captivity that happened and also the um, there may have been stalking as well that happened after the captivity which occurred uh, which has occurred for the person I'm thinking of um, they were stalked for seven years and in that time they were also attacked um, a number of times um, so they never felt safe. They never know, knew when this the captor would appear again. And all this talk about how safe England was, well, for the entire eight years that this all occurred in, she didn't feel safe. Um, and it wasn't until some years into therapy that she started to see that parts of England were safe and people were safe and help was available. So thanks for listening to my talk today. And um, if you do need help, then please reach out. And if you are in training, then... Um, the only thing I can add is whatever training you've had, get some more training um, because we can never cover everything in what we learn.
Okay, thanks. Bye.